That is an archetype that's very misunderstood in our modern society. We don't like challenge. We don't like healthy conflict. We don't understand how conflict is a first step towards unity. Conflict has the same etymology as everything, as communication,、uh, connection, con. It's、mm-hmm. together. And I love in Kabbalah the beautiful part is on the left side is Geburah, but that's the feminine side, and Mars is of the feminine. Because it's an opposite of Kesed, which is the Sefer of Jupiter. It's like I want more, and Mars is. It's beautiful to see it as feminine, and at the same time, as a man, to be initiated in the masculine is to get out of the comfort zone. Like you see it in a, in every tribe in、uh, in ancient cultures,、mm-hmm. a man is initiated differently than women. Women have a support system. Men need to go alone outside of the tribe. The moon outside of you can see the glyph. It's a it's a circle, and there's something pushing out of the circle. Any person on Earth can understand the Martian part of us, and it doesn't have to be. Oh, armies are bad, violence is bad. It's seeing the better side of it.、Uh, learning martial arts to protect yourself, having an army to protect yourself from. Hostile environments. This is a hostile world. It's not an easy reality to live in. Gevura touch、uh, teaches us to say no, to、uh, keep our balance, to cut ties that would、uh, create toxicity in our life,、mm. and to protect, turning the conqueror into protector. Welcome to the Casual Temple. Our guest today is Ali Andre Ular, who is a practical Kabbalist and paranormal professional who specializes in astrology, astro cartography, and divination readings to assist and guide seekers through their paranormal experiences. Thank you, Ali, for taking the time to chat with us. I'm really looking forward to learning more about you and your perspective on the unseen world. My pleasure is all mine, and it's an honor. Thank you. Thank you. Oh gosh! Well, usually I just kind of start kick off the conversation.、Um, sort of like, what event in your life would you say shaped the direction of your current spiritual path? You can go as far as you want to. Thank you for that question, Marley. <laughs> I mean,、uh, as everybody, I I don't know about you. I can think of the first dream I've ever had, which was. Uh, an experience very archetypal. It was very、uh, steeped in、uh, the 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 color I I use in my branding, and what I felt is things around me that I could not see or interact with,、mm. and that was the path that pushed me towards where I am and experience every day. It's. What is beyond the known? What is beyond what we understand as human beings, both scientific, both folkloric? And I spent my whole life with my family, being brought up in the Carpathian Mountains, interacting with、uh, the elders from that place, being like, "Hey, don't spend the night after." The moon phase at this specific hour, because you're gonna meet some dudes that have hoofs, and they're gonna do this certain thing, and etc. etc.、Mm-hmm. I had these transcendental experiences within my body in a sober experience, and I could not make sense of it. Right. Yeah, and、uh, l- later on. Uh, thankfully, I spent a lot of time m- meeting and being in、uh, megalithic sites in、uh, across Europe, from Karnak to Avebury, and uh, various uh, uh, cairns and burial mounds that were scattered around、uh, 
here in Transylvania, Poland, Scandinavia. And I just, sometimes I would go there, drink and sleep. Hmm. I don't know why. Yeah. But that initiated myself into the unknown. And here I am speaking with you. So I think you went into a good place. Yeah, I think so. I'm really fascinated by how your first experience was a dream. Is is kind of how you, it's really, that's really interesting. So I don't think I've had a guest that has necessarily said, like, it was definitely a dream because, and um, yeah, because if I think back, I feel like when I was a child too, I had a lot of like weird dreams that I couldn't really explain, <laughs> but they were really vivid, you know? Mm. Um, so that's, I, I'm fascinated by that. Um, and also I'm curious what your perspective is around um, kind of growing up with a lot of these folks around you that are like, don't go out during this certain moon phase, you know, that kind of, you know, that kind of thing. Um, because here in the West it's, or at least in America, I'll just speak for America because I'm American. That's just not a thing. Right. So I'm very curious <laughs> what your perspective of, of what is missing um, from the American West, I guess. <laughs> that is a very cool question. I appreciate it, Merrily. Mm-hmm. Um, we are, Romania now is part of the West as well. So on a uh, cultural subconscious level, we are of the same uh, society. Right. What we do, uh, the part in, in Europe is this specific city, this specific region has a very tight knit valley or Mm -hmm. region that it doesn't go out of that bounds but it does have similarities between all of them Mm -hmm. i I found the same things i learned in the carpathians that were in the appalachians in nova scotia right in in uh mongolia etc but what we miss i think in all of our society is uh we lack the understanding of time and Mm. nature and uncertainty and the unknown and we lose our cognitive ability to have a a healthy relationship with these parts of nature that are normal Mm -hmm. we we always want to know what we do we always want to have everything under control yeah and i don't think that's part of the human experience the fullest and understanding that from from the elders that survived communism here Mm -hmm. um is understanding uh, being in communion with parts of nature that we cannot control and are a bit scary beautiful and uh, terrifying at the same time Mm. yeah that's really well put i like that you brought up the um the appalachians here in america because it's definitely um, I had a guest, he and his, uh, he was talking about his family who tend to be from the Appalachian region and definitely close to the land and very strange things happen quite often <laughs> that would probably freak a lot of, you know, American city folk out. <laughs> so um, that was a really good perspective. Thank you for sharing that. Um, now, I know you mentioned, sorry, you had uh sort of elders maybe in your family or your community that uh, probably helped shape your path and help guide you. Um, Did you have any other forms of support or guidance as well kind of coming up? No, not at all. I Mm. felt very isolated in a sense with sharing these experiences with others. Uh, Only very elder people in a village somewhere would understand that hey that certain entity or archetypal force can visit you during this liminal part of your life but i grew up i was born in 89 and i grew up from the 90s in 89 the berlin wall fell and uh, our culture went from communism to democracy 
nobody knew what they were doing. Mm -hmm. uh, things happened, uh, certain pockets of lore and etymology still existed in the villages, but not really. So mm -hmm. in urban environment, in a secular society, it was the opposite. I did not understand what was happening to me. And I felt very separated from, uh, I think, what I think right now is uh, a thing that happens to most people normally and naturally. Yeah. That's a good, um, that is a good point. Like you do feel uh, separated from that and it should be maybe more natural. Um. Yeah, and I think there is kind of like a, a sense of that missing, but you can't maybe, at least I'm speaking for myself too, but um, you can't really put your finger on it until maybe some more investigation is happening. I mean, this, this, uh, yeah, the path of reconciliation with these parts, hidden parts of nature, I think we have to be one foot in it and one foot in the secular. Mm. We cannot dismiss either or. Right. But how can we function as mystics in, in a world where sometimes you're you're a kook in that <laughs> sense or the lulu, and in another sense you're too scientific and you're like, I don't know, yeah. whatever. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Um, that is the balance, right? It's like I think I even, I was talking to somebody recently and I said, yeah, it's a lot of it, at least for me, is being comfortable with being probably labeled as a cuckoo. <laughs> 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 um, but I think, you know, and you and I chatted also a little bit about how you have very scientific and analytical minds. And um, so, yeah, that's, <laughs> like, that's definitely quite a balance to strike. So, yeah, very cool. Um, and what would you say were some favorite books that you could point to along your path that were really integral for you? Yeah, uh, appreciate that question. Mm -hmm. it, sometimes it, it, it fluctuates from here and there, but specifically, I can remember being a practical Kabbalist. Mm. I, I did not read anything astrological, but with Kab Kabbalah, I like where we chatted, I just uh, traveled to Edinburgh, which is my mm -hmm. favorite uh, city in Europe. Shout out to all my Edinburgh peeps. <laughs> the moment I put my foot down from the train, I got this uh, archetypal, <laughs> like from the gut. Mm -hmm. Go to the occult bookshops and uh, get Kabbalistic books. I was not into Kabbalah at all. I did not understand what that was. But lo and behold, I went to the weird shop in uh, Edinburgh. Best, uh -huh. one of the best occult shops in Europe. And I asked one of my friends there to be like, can you give me a book that is super easy to digest? Mm -hmm. That's beginner. One that will uh, ruin my mind and be extremely uh, antagonistically uh, complicated. Mm -hmm. And one that is poetically uh, filled with hope for the future. And you would have this book as a desert island. And mm. this is the book uh, about Luria and the window of the soul. Oh, wow. I cannot recommend enough James David Dunn from the uh with forward from rabbi ernesto yata i could not stop reading the introductions of this book it was amazing put me on the path of understanding uh from animism to astrology kabbalah just answered the why oh, cool. the, the beginning parts were like uh in the middle pillar we all mm. know that Israel Ligardi's classic and uh, the advanced one was a treatise on the Sefer Yetzirah from Kaplan. Uh, so mm. super cool. Uh, 
Perfect. Wow. Yeah. I'm, I'm very excited because I haven't, I mean, I have the middle pillar by Israel Rigardi, but the other two books I'm not familiar with. And I mm. have the Sefer Yetzirah, but I feel like it's just raw, right? So this is like a yeah. translation. And so it's kind of, to me anyway, it's kind of impenetrable, right? It's like, what how do you, do you feel about that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think most, I think the impenetrability is like read a sentence, maybe sit with it instead of what I try to do is like reading the whole thing and going, hmm, not exactly sure what's going on there, but, um, but I think it's more contemplative. <laughs> That's the part with the Sefer Yetzirah. Mm -hmm. I would read it, put it to the side and let the subconscious figure it out. It does mm -hmm. not make sense. Yeah. <laughs> read it again. It does not make sense. Read it again. It does not make sense. Read it again. It does not make sense. You walk down the street one Tuesday evening starts to make sense right, <laughs> right. Think, like in technology it's kind of doing its background processes right <laughs> doing that. yeah and i would recommend uh for others like if you want to understand like the paranormal understanding mm -hmm. the unknown i would really recommend john keel uh especially the eighth tower to really have a different understanding of the archetypal forces it's not not cryptozoology it's not mm. ufo it's not aliens in a spaceship it's more than that it's us and outside mm. uh george p hansen's trickster and the paranormal if you can ever get a grip on that book it would oh, i cannot <laughs> recommend that enough oh. it is the best i think book to understand the liminal forces that we generate as human beings and outside of us in a uh, in a space that is uh being interacted with mm -hmm. the unknown and the trickster element behind it because it will always play various games around you mm -hmm. yeah uh I happen to read so now two more books I have to add to my list because uh, I think I definitely have like one of John Keel's books um, that I did start to read, but I haven't finished it. And I'm trying to remember which one it was. Um, you know which one it is? I'm sure Mothman? it's the one. Yeah, I think it was the Mothman uh, for sure, which it, it was again, I started it and I was like, I don't know. It's like, <laughs> I know, right? There's it's, a lot going on. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a lot. It's yeah. <laughs> some crazy stuff right there. Yeah. Um, yeah. but the other two books that you mentioned, cause I'm thinking of, um, demonic reality. Cause I talked about it on my show, which is, yeah, is amazing. Yeah. And then, right. um, gosh, what was the other one? Oh, and then I read, um, there was a book about pan, the God pan that came out. <laughs> the rebirth of pan, the rebirth of pan, which I read. Oh, and God. so I read those like at the same time. Right. And so when you're talking about the trickster element, you know, it's like, you know, trying to figure out what that means for us. What um, do you think the rebirth of Pan means? But I'm curious. Ooh, you know, I don't know if I, I don't know if I have a, a hundred percent formulated opinion on it. My current, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's going to change. Um, but my current feeling about it is that the rebirth of Pan is Pan is always evolving as a, as a cultural being and as a like a like a soul of the world incarnation like anima you know what i mean um right. yeah. because like i've seen pan like the figure of pan like it's in different cultures right? <laughs> like it shows up like the same type of being uh shows up in a lot of different cultures so um and i think he's trying to get us more attention now because like you said there's that disconnect with humans and our connection to nature um and so maybe that trickster element is coming out in some ways that you know sometimes the trickster isn't super nice right? <laughs> sometimes it's a bit too gnarly yeah exactly do, yeah. do you know what when uh, it was written there was a very specific transit happening mm, really yeah I know that what archetypal astrology uh, astrological archetype would you 
think pan is oh god oh what Ash? beyond like mercury <laughs> beyond mercury beyond mercury beyond like you know the outer ones mm. i'm going to say and this one sounds weird i'm gonna say saturn only because you know saturn is earth representative right like it's like earth. Earth. yeah okay perfect saturn was conjunct pluto whoa really when it was written and when was the last time saturn conjuncted pluto oh gosh yeah you would definitely know better than me <laughs> uh, i'm just gonna say it it starts with the word pan oh, demic oh the pan oh my gosh are you serious that's right yeah that's that's right. the rebirth of pan pan was the entity that saved athens mm -hmm. in mythology and it saved that dude who ran across from the uh that battle with the persians to to get to athens and sparta and be like yo we need help right because these dudes are killing us yeah but pan at the meantime saw the marathon runner the battle of marathon mm -hmm. was like yo I, I can help you if you build a temple for me you know mm -hmm. not not in the center of the of the city because I'm, I'm still a weirdo <laughs> wild guy right. but just adjacent mm -hmm. if you worship Fair. me <laughs> i'm gonna make those people pan ick mm -hmm. Hmm. Pan rebirths itself archetypally through pan something, pandemics, panic, and it loves panification. Like we call it in Latin, bread. Mm. Oh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> that was the time when uh, that part of nature came into being. But without panic, cannot exist. Mm, that is oh, that's more that's cool I never considered that and yeah he definitely writes about he meaning oh gosh I'm trying to remember the author but in the pan book <laughs> um, he definitely writes a lot about like pandemics and panics and like how that relates and then um, yeah so that's really cool that you put that together and illustrated that when you go into the woods and, and spend time with the unknown there will not there will be a time when you will face terror Oof. and pan will be an embodiment of panic mm. i've had that numerous times and i'm trying to make it more of a healthy embodiment mm. in my life sometimes it's more destructive than odd but that's how that type of mm, you're in the wild but you like the commodity of being around humans type of it, it, it's the it's why the wild nature it's an embodiment communing with us trying to be hey there's more to life than this mm. that's how i perceive it at least yeah at the, uh, this time yeah yeah Ooh, yeah it's definitely like a shake it like kind of shakes you up you know <laughs> it will <laughs> Uh, yeah yeah and i know in a lot of um not a lot but there's in the, some magical practices it's kind of encouraged that you go by yourself into the woods and do something. And i'm like whoo have not done it yet because it's uh yeah working myself up <laughs> but i just want to say if you start giving an offering to the woods mm -hmm. you, you you cannot stop you have okay. to keep going that's what there's a very haunted forest near near Cluj, the Hoya Bacha forest. Mm -hmm. And I started giving offerings of panification. Mm. You should not stop whenever you go there. So, you know, it's like taking care of a pet. Ah, yeah. It, there's a there's a hidden uh rule set of understanding the unknown mm. within and without. Once you start giving something to Pan, you, you can st st uh, stop. So better mm. to just not give right. too much. <laughs> right. That's good advice. I'll have to remember that. Um, 
I will just mention uh, that my mom, so my mom is Filipino. And uh, so definitely very, I, you know, listening to the stories of kind of my great grandmother, she's very um, in touch with the woods so much. So she would do offerings to like the bamboo forests and um, anytime. And she would, was really strict about like anybody is entering that forest. You have to come to me first because I have to get permission right before you go in there. Um, and then apparently one of my great uncles did not do that and he broke his leg. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. And then she had to go in with like a big tray of something to the woods for hours, my mom said, and like talk to whatever was in there uh, to get them to like help his leg heal. <laughs> I can, uh, I can say yes. Yes. Right. That's how it happens. You, yeah. you just you talk to the woods like a weirdo and say, hey, can I? <laughs> it does make pan is it means all in latin mm, mm -hmm. so you're talking with everything within and right. without yeah that's a good that's a good way of looking at it very you know again sort of that animus sort of thing like it's all it's all you it's all it's all and it's all of them and it, yeah it's us and them and neither and everything right <laughs> hold that together hold it at once <laughs> make sense of it yes <laughs> exactly <laughs> oh man that's great oh um so thank you for sharing your thoughts on pan that was really super intriguing uh what would you say your current um spiritual path looks like that you're kind of following Interesting uh, question. It always evolves. Mm -hmm. I, I started, uh, that's how I learned astrology is from gardening, just taking care of plants. And you do certain things with plants at certain uh, certain phases of the moon. That's just the farmer's almanac. Every person who takes care of plants knows this. You preen when the moon is waning, you change pots when there's a new moon. Uh, you let the fruits take root in full moon. What I had fortune of is being surrounded by really cool like women friends. And they, at the same time, when I was taking care of the plants, they would be like, oh, the moon's in cancer. I feel this way. Hmm. The moon's in Leo. I feel this. I'm like, I understood empirically that the moon doesn't influence the plants, mm. but it is a barometer. It is a clock. It's a neoplatonic way of seeing the universe. It's, it's just, you look at the sky and it's like, ah, oh, now I need to do this. Mm. But then something shifted. It's like, let me just observe. And it's cool with, the moon because it changes signs every two and a half days so you could take a step back and see how that archetype would manifest in other people around you for a year or two and i was just oh this is when the moon in cancer waning is moon waxing in cancer taurus aries i was very skeptical with astrology so mm. Um, that was a catalyst because before that there were these experiences in nature that I did not understand, uh, ecstatic experiences. I would walk through the woods and had contemplative outer body experiences just by walking, just by being around nature. What is that? I did not know. Uh, so that is the root of my path mm -hmm. but understanding astrology understanding animism i, I could not uh, get why it doesn't mm -hmm. respond to why why this why that it, it, you could you know because of this spirit or because of that planet the aspect of kabbalah and contemplative mysticism is the, the missing ingredient so now what i do is Whenever I'm triggered 
or my nervous system gets out of whack, take a step back and try to see the beauty in life. See a color that I like. Uh, remember beauty. Remember the fact that this universe is imperfect as am I. So why fight against it? this is where I'm going uh mm -hmm. trying to go from astrology like oh you know re you rep it there's a sp spring summer blah 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 what's the point right beauty is the point love is the point mm -hmm. so that's where I'm going into yeah. being alive and all that entails in our modern life all the pressures and uh, and uh struggles but at the same time can i see beauty in everything mm. not in a delulu way not in a <laughs> manifesting stuff you know you know <laughs> right. does this sound uh does this uh jive with you does this sound familiar yeah it's definitely kind of like what i'm getting from what you're saying um is just kind of being right and absorbing instead of like putting that mental like brain out there like when I like when you said um what like I'm asking why why it's kind of like a child right when a child asks an adult why they want it explained right the sky is blue because of da 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 da, da right and that and that's kind of what we are expecting but I think you beautifully were explaining it's like you know, sometimes you're not going to get the answer. Like da, 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 da. you might even like, get an answer. <laughs> you're just, like, you're just kind of there. No yeah. Um, so I really like that. And, you know, of course, you know, there's like trying to find the beauty, you know, understanding that love is really the thing that holds the things together. Um, even though it seems so hard sometimes. <laughs> I know. Right. <laughs> That's right. the test. That's always it. Yeah. Oh, so cool. Um, and so I know, uh, so is this how sort of astrology became sort of a big part of your path was like the plant working with plants and then kind of feeling this out and that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I it really was into gardening, mm -hmm. uh, 10 years ago and spending a lot of my, all my past was in camping because mm -hmm. of my parents and uh living in the mountains and when you spend time a lot in nature if you you can talk to hunters you can talk to hikers mm -hmm. there's a point where they will meet something outside of themselves mm -hmm. and you cannot put it into words so that's where for me <laughs> in in a strange way when there's always a, a moment where you go into the unknown, but you, you, you disconnect yourself from that path. I think mm. going on a path, you have to first lose the path. Ooh. And, and I went through that but f f randomly when I went into a corporate environment in, in a finance, mm -hmm. I got sent to work uh, remotely in the UK in 2015 right next to Avebury. I was not expecting this, but Avebury being my favorite place in Europe because it's a medieval, a medieval, Neolithic stone circle mm -hmm. from thousands of years ago. And I got randomly dumped there with a team. And one of my friends from the corporate environment asked, asked the, uh, the cab driver that would take us from the place where we were sitting to in the nearby county to the offices where we would work. And we're like, Hey, we're, we're living in a very remote place. Is there like a civilization thing here? Is there malls or something? It's like, Hey, there's like a, a stone circle here. If you're like one of your friends, maybe he likes the weird place. <laughs> and my face dropped because my whole life, since I was five years old, I dreamt to be in Avebury. Mm. So every weekend, I would spend time in blizzards and cold weather, just walking around the Neolithic sites, meditating on uh, catacombs mm. and places of the dead, and just 
initiating myself in that way mm-hmm. not knowing that that's a thing actually right just felt natural seems like yeah just, yeah just go and sleep on a burial mound <laughs> see what happens like right, right. <laughs> oh wow yeah that's cool i like that you took that initiative and that opportunity right you're like i'm here i've been dreaming about it what do i want to do i want to sit sit there and like let it absorb or whatever that's super cool oh and i did want to say because you mentioned um because i've been to edinburgh once and this is many years ago before any of my like occult and esoteric life but i remember walking because you know you tour the edinburgh castle as you do and yeah (laughs) there was the room they take you into like the chapel room which is really small and I remember I walked in there and I was like, Ugh, like, and I said, there's like a speed, is there a speaker in here? And they were like, what are you talking about? I'm like, there's like a buzzing in this room. <laughs> it's like really strong. And everybody was like, what are you, I'm like, there's, I think there's a, spe- you guys have a speaker or a light or something is making a lot of noise. And they were like, I don't know what you're talking about. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> but I think it was just, just a lot of energy for some reason. Yeah. You know, those medieval places. Yeah, I can't stand those medieval places. <laughs> as as much, hey, I, I love Edinburgh, but I yeah. like the new buildings. I mean, mm. narrow corridors, buzzing. It's, it's like so much old energy in a place. Oh. No way. Yucky. <laughs> Yucky. Ask me. <laughs> Pretty yuck. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I'm glad. Thanks for the the uh, validation on the buzzy weird energy. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, I've been in the catacombs behind Edinburgh, and they were like, "Oh, this is where people died." I'm like, "Great, why am I here? <laughs> Wait, what are we doing here? <laughs> why, why? What a wonderful experience! I love it. Cannot yeah. wait to be in the suffocating sub basement. Oh, the things we do for uh, <laughs> to look into stuff." Ah, um, well, wonderful. I know, um, you kind of, ha- you, you talked a bit about Kabbalah and we chatted a bit about it in our, you know, pre-chat call. How would you describe, um, Kabbalah, like mysticism and practical Kabbalah that you're kind of working with in that fashion? Great question. Thank you. I mean, mm-hmm. Kabbalah is, it, what it means is is a tradition, an oral tradition, is something that you give, is to give. And the thing that I love about it is that it's a dialogue that keeps on going. You can add to it as a heretic. Like, I'm not into... Uh, let's say Judaism or Christianity or something like that Mm -hmm. even though ironically I think I'm more into divinity than those people Mm -hmm. but in a more contemplative abstract way right but it's this through the act of giving and the dialogue continues it's not a it doesn't have a beginning and an end that's where it like the Sefer Zohar, mm. mm-hmm. it's a dialogue between various uh, personalities that the author's world. It's not one person. There's right. many. That's right. Yeah. That's the beauty of it. It's We add to the uh, tradition by mm. living and giving more and by seeing beauty and being in honor of beauty and working for beauty. So mm-hmm. you add to the Kabbalah without knowing. I add to the Kabbalah without knowing by being just a better dude and do that. That's right. it. <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's a really beautiful way of looking at it. I didn't think, um, I think that was kind of missing in what I've been looking at as far as like the Kabbalah is sort of the, um, that it was like the, the Zohar um, was written by several different people. I think I had watched, um, oh gosh, uh, just, I'm sure you've seen Justin Sledge and Esoterica and he, his, ch- yeah, he's a pop, pop, pop channel. Um, and he kind of goes through a lot of the Kabbalah and 
I, I remember him talking about it, but I didn't absorb it in that way until you explained it. So I appreciate I, I love Dr. That. Sledge. He, he yeah. comes from a very more astute, historic, academic yes. place. Yes, for sure. Again, I come from a more experiential, weirdo, yeah. weirdo <laughs> place <laughs> yeah. as a heathen, but <laughs> I do partake. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's it's beautiful. I I, mm -hmm. I cannot overestimate uh, over share how how beautiful the Zohar is. It's yeah. just insane. Yeah, it's like what a gift, right? That we we have it to look at in these times, and oh yeah, I love it. Um, so can you tell me? Now I know because I looked at you. You help a lot of your uh, clients and people that you work with on sort of their paranormal experiences and. Um, one of the offerings on your website is uh, Kabbalistic astrology. And I'm very curious um, what that what that is. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, I mean, yeah. you know, uh, just Sledge said this as well. There's no correspondences with the Sephirah. There's things in those uh, understandings, the, the tree of life, and all those little circles that are mm -hmm. beyond our understanding. But for us to understand it better, I think the work of, let's say, Crowley, you know, everybody else, I think it's it's very important just to un make our mind see the bridges between things. Mm -hmm. And like in Israel Regardi's book, The Middle Pillar, that's the point. I think we talked about this. It's like a, a, a balance between masculine and feminine, a balance between harsh and light, uh, good and bad, dark and light. It's, I think, despair and hope, for example, are the same thing, different sides of a coin. Right. So practicing this with, with uh, clients is, they have an emotional response. They're having a, an emotional experience that is very steeped into one of these elements, be it water, air, fire, earth, or a planetary archetype. Okay, let's balance it out with the opposite. Like it's too much air, bring some fire, bring some water, bring some earth. Too much Saturn, bring some uh, sun. Too much sun, bring some Saturn. So that is what I do in my practice is uh, when I'm going to meet my husband, when I'm going to do this, it's like, no, it's understand the absence, understand the void, mm. accept it. And like in Lurianic Kabbalah, it's create a space with no, no, no. It's like a quilt. And you create a space for something and poof, mm -hmm. the universe adheres uh, a void and it will create something. So Kabbalistically, it's that from imperfect to imperfect, you, you breathe in and then breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. So helping people understand that we lose things in life by... Mm. there's nothing to fear it's yeah. a part of creation oh. yeah do you see it similar or how mm -hmm. do you see it uh, kabbalah combined with astrology oh gosh yeah pretty much you know again you explained it very well i i like your you know the association with like the breath that you did and then the, the quilt because the way i've been um, kind of explaining to folks is like containers, like, um, at least like, yeah, like, like, a my magical practice and like understanding, like you create sort of like a container for something for, right. you know, like if you're man, you know, let's say manifesting, um, you create the container of like, this is what I actually want now, you know, <laughs> I need the spirit energy to get in there. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. Yeah. And so that's just kind of how I've been conceptualizing it. Um, that's like beautiful. That. Makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Um, 
Yeah. And it is like, you know, we talked about that before is like, yeah, for me, it's all about balancing uh, myself. Cause like I have, and we're going to talk, I hope we're going to get to chat a little bit about Gebera and Mars. Um, but my planetary chart ruler is Mars, but I'm a Pisces sun. Right. And so there's like a, <laughs> like a, a push pull with that. Um, and yep. so, uh, yeah, so it's just kind of really understanding those elements and what I need to lean into to either, you know, understand a situation that's causing me some, some anxiety or strife or like a person that's causing me anxiety or strife or, you know, some, something like what is the energy that needs to balance, like you said, like to balance this out. Um, yeah. 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 And so it's very, We're much very best. similar. <laughs> yeah. yeah cool well I'm gl- I'm really glad that you um you help people along with that because it is and like you said I, you know some people might come to you and like oh I want like a husband <laughs> or like how do I get how do we get that <laughs> you're like well I mean we all do but yeah right, exactly. you know, <laughs> yeah what vessel are you pouring yourself into yeah like you said. Yeah. We're all vessels. Everything is a vessel. Our thoughts, our emotions, mm-hmm. our being, they're all a bubble. They're mm-hmm. all a vessel. Mm-hmm. And oh. vessels break sometimes. Yes. <laughs> they do. Then you put it together. That's right. In a better way. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so good. Um, yeah, and I did want to just chat a little bit about because you were talking about Mars energy and you know. I really liked what you had to say about that because um, I was relaying to you how I was having trouble, you know, because I have a planetary altar for all of the planets. Um, there's a particular Greek art store from Greece that I was ordering my my figures from, but they didn't have Mars. Like it had everybody else, did not have Mars. And I was like, that is so strange why they wouldn't have Mars. And then when I went to look for like an Aries or Mars statue, it was kind of hard. I mean, I could, but I'm also very picky. <laughs> like I wanted it to look cool. Um, and I did finally find something that I really liked, but it took me a little while. Um, but, you know, from what I got from that was like people, it feels like people are kind of uncomfortable with Mar- Mars energy and, you know, kind of no wonder, like we have <laughs> like a lot of Mars energy happening in the macro level right now. Um, So I'm just curious what your perspective is about people's relationship with Mars and Gebera and Aries and all of that. Thank you for that question. That's a very valid question. And Mm -hmm. I think that is an archetype that's very misunderstood in our modern society. Mm -hmm. We don't like challenge. We don't like healthy conflict. We don't understand how conflict is a first step towards unity. Mm. Conflict has the same etymology as everything, as communication, uh, connection, con, mm. it's mm-hmm. together. That's right. <laughs> it's a part of, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I love in Kabbalah, th- the beautiful part is on the left side is Gevura, mm-hmm. but that's the feminine side. And Mars mm-hmm is of the feminine because the feminine is like no i don't want this no you cannot have this Hmm. and you see that in scorpio for example very beautifully expressed in the feminine essence of mars because every 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 uh archetype has the archetypal masculine archetypal feminine Mm -hmm. And to better understand Mars, understand Scorpio. It's like, no, fuck off. And because <laughs> it's an opposite of Kesed, which is the Sephiroth right. of Jupiter. It's like, I want more. And yeah. Jupiter is, uh, and Mars is. <laughs> Put it down. <laughs> yeah. It's beautiful to see it as feminine. Mm, yeah. And at the same time, as a man, because I worked in uh, like Joseph Campbell space, like mm. uh, uh, let's say uh, an archetypal cis man, whatever, mm-hmm. uh, to be initiated in the masculine is to get out of a comfort zone. Like you see it in a, in every tribe, in um, 
in ancient cultures. Mm -hmm. A man is initiated differently than women. Women have a support system. Men need to go alone outside of the tribe, right. outside of the moon, outside of, you can see the glyph. It's a, it's a circle mm -hmm. and there's something pushing out of the circle. Right. Any person on earth can understand the Martian part of us. And it doesn't have to be, oh, armies are bad. Like mm. violence is bad. It's seeing the better side of it. Uh, learning martial arts to protect yourself. Having an army to protect yourself from hostile environments. This is a hostile world it's not an easy reality to live in so right. gevura touch it teaches us to say no to uh keep our balance to cut ties that would uh, create toxicity in our life mm. and to protect turning the conqueror into protector i think that's very misunderstood mm -hmm. and that's again uh especially in the male environment. Our fathers did not get initiated in that environment. Right. They don't yeah. know what the unknown is. I know. <laughs> there it is. You, you got to go there. You got to go when it's where it sucks and it's scary. So yeah. Gibura is like, please do. <laughs> oh, oh, and so beautifully explained. I love it. Um, and, uh, you know, and I'll just say for this, as a woman, you know, again, with my, <laughs> my uh, Mars chart ruler, um, it is like figuring out where to point that energy, you know what I mean? And, you know, and I'm, I'm learning more as I go, but like pointing the energy in a way that is beneficial to me and then not in a way that is going to cause me more <laughs> like conflict. Cause whew, yeah, that, you know, that Martian fire comes out when it needs to <laughs> I think it's part of the feminine, uh, feminine yeah. as well. Just, just be who you are. Don't take the uh, nonsense from anybody. Right. Own yourself and uh, own that m m margin side. I think it's uh, attractive no matter what. Mm -hmm. to just embody that in a healthy way. Right. Yeah. And I think uh, when we delve into the spaces of the unknown, what better place than Mars to help us navigate from the, the nonsense around it? Oh, that is a great, great point. Yeah. What better energy to have with you when you're going into the unknown? So good. Yeah. Oh, all right. And I know, um, so kind of going back to sort of what you work with your clients on, um, you also do something with like astrology and animism. I'm very curious, like what, what that looks like. If you can tell us, that would be great. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, mm -hmm. animism is seeing the world living mm. a thought an emotion is its own living entity, culture, institutions. They're all a living being in a, in a different environment. So whenever you go outside a river, a molecule, a thought, everything is alive. So it's, it's the opposite of static. But it does help us understand that there's places, there's moments in life where there's a birth, a middle, and a death. There's a liminality in it. And I think we're really in this uh, liminal space now with when it's too much Pisces or a mutable sign like Saturn now, mm, Neptune, we're in a corridor. We're not there where we're not in the other place. Mm. So how can we make sense of it? To apply that animistic sense is to do crossroad magic, to do things that our elders used to do. You can go outside when you cross the street, you're at a stop sign. And you're like, from this moment forward, I'm not going to do what I did that I didn't like. And when that life changes, I'm going to go forward. That type of folkloric, simple magic does something to your psyche. Mm. A liminal space is a mode of transportation, a bus, an airport, a 
hospital. You're not there to be. Even like if you think about it, life is a liminal space. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> animism is just, uh, and, and practicing it through astrology is, I use the language of astrology to make it a bit more succinct. Mm. So it's just not a bit too, I am keep working on things that are too complex to make it more simple. But if you're grieving a past relationship, let's go on a crossroads and you have, you're coming from a, a path and you have three other paths or whatever. You take the initiative, you take one path, and you honor what was. You're like, thank you for everything you was. You look one last time behind and you go ahead. It's not just burning a, a, a picture. You let it go into water if you want something more simple and uh, heartfelt uh, or in the air or just working with these simple elements of making reality more alive around us because mm -hmm. a lot of with astrology you look at this like 2d circle right <laughs> like oh, whatever yeah but if you transplant it in in a folkloric sense that everybody understands you it, it does start to life starts to become a fragrant full effulgent mm. it's very beautiful Right. So, yeah, that's how I see it. Cool. Yeah, I think that's very helpful. Yeah, you're right. Because it is kind of, you know, I, and especially when people come to astrology who maybe are very fresh to it and then sort of using so folklore and sort of these things that people are maybe more comfortable with instead of like, shop, you know, giving them degrees and <laughs> houses and, they're like, you know, I love that. So it's very cool. Um. And so I know one thing, because I've heard of on your kind of offerings is um, astrocartography. <laughs> so I've sort of heard about it. I don't really quite know what it is. So if you don't mind explaining it and then how you, that you kind of work with that with uh, with folks, be cool. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. I mean, whenever, I, I don't know what, what do you do when for you ex specifically, Merrily, uh, mm. when you have too much, like, things stress you out. So what, what's your go-to when you take a step back and recalibrate your nervous system, let's say? Yeah, I actually was talking with somebody this weekend about that. But what I do um, is I'll go in meditation and because uh, I feel it, it feels like I'm pushing too much of my energy out to make something happen. And then it just causes me, like you said, like nervous system situations. So what I do is I sit quietly and I give gratitude. I start with small things and I keep giving gratitude and, you know, and just list the things that I'm grateful for. And that really calms me down. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, that's kind of how I do it. Very beautifully Piscean. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a weirdo Virgo, so I look at maps. <laughs> oh, I do like, well, I make lists too, because I'm a Virgo moon. I do make lists. <laughs> I'm also Virgo moon, so yeah. <laughs> so That's funny. Just opening, uh, let me see the weather and, and just looking at, oh, this is the storm front over this village. And mm. just saying that I'm a, a complete, if there's always something to be a nerd of, I would be a geography nerd. I love geography. <laughs> I know too many things about too many other countries and <laughs> whatever. <laughs> but it's it's the same principle of turning something within that's a map because astrology is basically a 2D map right. that we interpret to make sense of the world. And then we expand it over a 3D sphere. And that, the moment where you're born, there are certain lines and certain things that showcase that, hey, this is a part of the world where you feel more free in this area, more inhibited in this area. And I love bi binding these two because I can nerd out the things. So uh, it's a bit creepy because I looked at certain parts in the world that are very specific and then 
certain things happen in life that force you to be there. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. And and I I, I love making uh, these these readings for clients because it's they can be inhibited in a career but feel good in family in a place. But finding a balance in in, in somewhere but understanding that you have to put effort into it somewhere. It's not, but like we say, we, there's cultures and places, there's no perfect uh, country, but you can find in, in America, it's like a continent. Mm-hmm. It's bigger than Europe. Mm-hmm. So from the Pacific to the Atlantic, the whole space can be such a myriad different place from Colorado to Maine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's what I do. I help people see in that space and time in their life what, depending on what they want, where would they want to be, but mm. more so because we live in this internet age and we can like I'm I'm from Romania now, Transylvania. I'm talking to you from from uh the Pacific. Uh there's no barriers in that way. Right. So you can attract people from a different part of the world through astrocartography that way. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. I love, I love maps. So yeah, that's best perfect. Of both worlds. Right. Ah, oh, I wonder, cause, um, cause I do sort of, you know, psychic aura readings with people. And I did have this one woman ask me and she was like, where should I move to? <laughs> And, you know, I'm kind of seeing sort of, you know, I'm giving my sort of psychic, like right. what I feel is, you know, I'm getting from the reading at that point in time. But I right. feel like that question feels more appropriate to somebody like you, <laughs> it seems like. I mean, you you said something about Greece. Do you know what Zodiac sign Greece is? Oh, gosh. If I were to guess, I would say the Zodiac sign. Hold on. Uh, Leo, but I have no idea. <laughs> Aries. Oh, Aries. Oh, of course, Aries. <laughs> and in the age of Aries, it's still Aries. It's it's super Aries. Wow. That makes it is so. Yeah, it is so much like that. <laughs> Fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you know what? Oh, as an American, <laughs> do you know what American is? is uh, yeah, science? it's cancer. Is it can? Oh, cancer really huh. yeah it's the fourth of july that's right i mean some people debate on when the uh uh what's it called uh i'm sorry mm-hmm. the declaration of independence was signed mm-hmm. what day but i think from my understanding it's uh, cancer sun sagittarius rising uh aquarius moon hmm interesting it makes sense uh, romania yeah. is, is sagittarius with sagittarius rising and there's some correlations with this version of romania right so <laughs> every country every business everything like an animistic perspective has mm. archetypal essences uh, in back from blueprints like this so mm. yeah you, you you guys are really cancer so in, in the good you know the, the fixed water sign, right. uh, cardinal water sign. Oh, yeah. I have, um, both of my parents are cancers, so I'm kind of like, hmm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's certain countries like, I don't like, I like certain um, signs for certain things, mm. not in a culture, for example. I like Libra a lot in certain people or relationships, not in a country. So hence, I don't like Germany. Right. Sorry, <laughs> Germany. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fair. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Uh, well, yeah, thanks for that. Ah, super cool. Now I'm like, I'm going to start thinking about astrocartography now because of this. So that's great. Yeah, it's 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 becoming something. There's some accounts I really saw on Instagram. It's really cool. And uh, mm-hmm. But if you start to micromanage... Mm. Like, for example, when you have your solar return, there are people who want to travel to a certain place to have a better solar return. 
Mm. I think that's micromanagement. Just be where you are. And yeah. oh, it's in the sixth house. Oh, oh, dear me. How bad. <laughs> yeah. I like the sixth house. I really like the sixth house. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. Um, cool. So how would you say that um you how do you personally use astrology like in your day-to-day -day or in your life? Thank you. Uh, again, to understand uh, certain voids or, or uh, let's say, if I am feeling too uh, emotional, mm. too creative, too much fire, too much water, oh. I have to bring some air, some uh, earth. What I use it is corresponding with the wheel of the year. Mm -hmm. there's certain things that the season of winter teaches us the season of summer teaches us and that reminds if, if, think of winter it starts in the cardinal sign of earth capricorn the middle of it is the fixed air sign of aquarius mm -hmm. and the end of it the death of it is the mutable sign of water it misses fire fire sign so what it teaches us, focus on fire more. Mm. How can I focus on fire in my own way? In the Leo, Sagittarius, Aries aspects of me to highlight those in a, in a period when that is missing in the outer world. Mm. Through me, I then create balance and harmony in reality. So that's how I use it. It's like, Certain seasons have a certain period when I have, like, I, I had a very gnarly Saturn transit. I know I can balance it with something non-Saturnian. There's always a negative aspect happening. At the same time, a positive aspect is happening. There's no in-between. It's, it's always happening at the same time. So what astrology is helping me to understand is, to not get sucked into a repeating pattern of just blaming it on Saturn or this. Mm, mm -hmm. if, if you start seeing astrology like a path forward, like applying the wheel of the year, like every autumn, the death of an autumn brings a, 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 a spring and so on and so forth. It's a step forward. Mm, very cool. Uh, that's what it helps me to articulate a bit the aspects of nature I cannot put into words right or practicality that much yeah mm -hmm. yeah thank you yeah that's good to think about I didn't consider that that you kind of want to offset sort of maybe the time of year with certain energies and yeah that's really cool um so we're kind of wrapping up but uh do you happen to have either like a favorite client story to share or at least how you enjoy working with clients or something that you'd like to share about that. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, like I'm, I'm, I'm exploring to not work just one-on-one -on -one with clients. I want to make things more evergreen, but that you, I have a, a day job that learn from that to apply to mm -hmm. this, to this space. Also, it's been like so many years since I practiced, being an astrologer with clients uh, mm -hmm. since six, seven years ago. But one thing specifically came to mind. I, I'm like, it's not, we talked about this previously, not when I get a husband or a wife or this thing or that thing. A lot of my clients come for very gnarly things. Mm -hmm. Why did that rape happen? Why did right. I lose that baby? Why did that person die in that way yeah i'm 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 a person i'm a man i'm a i'm a, I'm a human being I, I don't have an answer for that what can i share through these interpretations is to see it's not like that manifestation new age like it's your fault it's your mm. fault mm. Mm -hmm. you manifested it because you're this 5d person right <laughs> <laughs> that's a bit spiritual bypassing in my view but how can i understand through archetypal means 
uh, specifically, like I said, that that person with a, a miscarriage is like, why did that happen? Why did I lose that baby? Mm. And we we got deep into it, like a psychiatrist. Why? You ask why until it bleeds and it hurts. Mm. And you use the language of archetypal astrology to see, hey, you are going through this in this period. And I'm here to see you. I'm here to understand you. You're, you're not alone in this. You are a human being. And I hope that this experience makes you strong mm. through it all. So I, I keep remembering that because it was highly personal and uh, it made me very uh, fulfilled and whole that I could bring not escapism, but meaning to entropy and the unknown. That's what I want. I want to be a conduit to meaning from absence and the void. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Beautifully said. Yeah. I think mm. a lot of times it is people just need someone with them. <laughs> you know now we yeah. there's like the left brain logic and rationale a plus mm. b equals c and that's in, in in math it's like algebra mm. but there's the other part of math that's more gnostic and abstract like derivatives mm -hmm. uh add infinity to infinity plus one what does it <laughs> what <Right. laughs> It's not numbers. Right. Yeah. It's a feeling. Mm -hmm. It's a feeling. Yeah. So That's that awesome. it's trying to make sense of the world, bridging these gaps. Mm -hmm. Does that resonate with you? Does, oh, uh, for you... sure. Yeah, yeah. And I think, yeah, when I do work for people, I think it is just a lot of times, you know, um, in a different modality, but it's similar, right? A lot of times I feel like you're, you're just being present for somebody and like letting them, you know, and being kind of a guide, you know, cause you know, we've also done our, done some work or whatever and like what has helped us and to help guide somebody who um, doesn't know which, maybe what steps to take or just how to be present with their own, you know, mind and what's going on with them. But um, yeah, but I, I like the idea of like having somebody, <laughs> having somebody with you because I think a lot of times you're just kind of told to like buck up and figure it out yourself. <laughs> yeah. Nasty things happen to good people, yeah. which is true, but why? Yeah. Ask why until it bleeds. Why until it bleeds. Yeah. Oof. Yeah. That's, that's when you get to it, I guess. And that's, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, oh, well, thank you so much, Ollie. Um, so where can folks find out about you to learn more about you and like the cool things that you do and what you're up to? <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right now, currently is just uh, on Instagram at oao.mysticism. Uh, thankfully, you found me there. Mm -hmm. um, I'll have more goodies coming forward as well as a course, website, uh many other things so keep an eye on it but you can find me specifically on instagram mm -hmm. there uh reach out to me dm me get in touch like it's cool we're we're, we're like it, it's cool to talk to people who are have these passions so mm -hmm. don't be a stranger yeah for sure and i'm very fond like i we talked about your branding like you have this beautiful purple all over your your Instagram and I'm like very much about it and on your webpage too. And it's all like, oh yeah, very Virgo. Thank like so it's just us. So good. <laughs> Thank um, you. Thank you. Yeah. It's very important. The, the aesthetic. <laughs> oh, for sure. I get you. <laughs> um, so what words of wisdom would you, you've so much words of wisdom today, but what would you, <laughs> words of wisdom would you like to leave us with today? Oh, <laughs> thank you. I mean, I, I keep coming back to this. I, uh, I'm i more into like Western hermeticism. So everything from Western stuff, all of it comes back to Egypt. Everything from mm -hmm. Christianity to 
heathenism or whatever it, it always comes back to egypt is the common node of everything and we can think of hermes trismegistus the person archetype deity or whatever i keep remembering from the uh corpus hermeticum uh this this dude and in egypt he's called toth and he's the uh tricks and not the tricks but the messenger of atom the primordial everything mm -hmm. and so beautifully toth hermes this archetype is saying hey to live a spiritual life to live a life of morals to constantly strive for better is to remember one simple thing to be in communion with divinity and that is to be in awe mm -hmm. and i think the thing is so hard to do in our modern time where just you have to pay the bills you have to do this you're looking at the news and it's grotesque and horrid and etc etc even right. beauty you get smitten with beauty too much it's awe it's different so i think and i want to leave everyone like are you practicing awe are you practicing like being uh a child from within to be wow i am alive i'm having this conversation primarily i'm enjoying this this is beauty this is a blessing not as uh, something to use as escapism mm -hmm. but like hermes says and toth says if you want to be in contact with creator and beyond creator with the nothing you have to be in awe and that is first and last most important thing in spiritual practice. So be in awe. Love it. Beautiful. Love it, love it, love it. And I like that you equated it with like kind of being a, a child, right? And sort of like everything's shiny and ah, so good. I love it, Ollie. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you too. It's been a pleasure and an honor. Your support means the world to us. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please take a moment to like, comment, and share it with others who might find this content valuable. And of course, don't forget to hit that subscribe button to stay tuned for more enlightening discussions. Your engagement helps us grow, and we appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you for being a part of the Casual Temple community. 